All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the January edition of the Research Showcase. I'm Dario. I run the research team. And today, I'm excited to have uh, two presentations. Uh, we have uh, our own uh, Aaron Helfiker presenting on productivity measurements uh, on English Wikipedia. And we have a guest presentation by Jerome Acker from uh, uh, the uh, ETH uh, student survey. And uh, we're going to present uh, for 30 minutes uh, for each presentation, allow probably five, five minutes at the end of each presentation. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the session. So stick around. You can also uh, join the conversation on IRC. And uh, with that, uh, I'll give Aaron uh, the, the first box. Aaron, stage is yours. Great. Thanks, Dario. Uh, let me just get my slides going. OK, so today I'm going to be talking to you about some uh, productivity measures that I took at Wikipedia and what this might imply for how we look at anonymous editors um, and a few other fun things that I found along the way as well. So I, I always like to pull out this, this slide whenever I'm introducing myself at the beginning of a talk and I direct you to the, the quote that I have underneath my, my title at the Wikimedia Foundation, Think Big, Measure What You Can, and Build Better Technologies. This presentation is definitely going to be about measurements. It's a set of measurements that I took that have some implications. Um, they're not, they didn't really start with thinking big. They really just started with trying to figure out what was going on. OK, so uh, I have three takeaways for you. Uh, and I'm going to start with them. I'll also cover them back at the end. Um, one is that we can use this measure that I've been working on, content persistence, as a robust measurement of article writing productivity in Wikipedia. Two, that English Wikipedia seems to be getting more efficient over time. Um, and finally, that anonymous editor contributions are really important. They actually represent about 15 to 20 percent of the overall productivity in Wikipedia. Um, so maybe we should consider anonymous editors as we're building new features. OK, so moving on, what the heck is this content persistence thing? So really, when I talk about content persistence, I'm talking about how content survives through revisions of an article in Wikipedia. So on the screen, what I have right now is a, a sample article or a sample set of five revisions of an article about apples. Um, so we can see that uh, the word apples, which was added in the first revision, persists for all five revisions. Um, the word red has a little bit of a complicated history, but it keeps coming back if it ever gets removed. However, the word blue that's added in the second revision of the article doesn't stick. It immediately gets removed. And so the idea with uh, persistent revisions is that we should be, or persistent Ah, sorry, content persistence, is that we should be able to get a sense for the quality of a contribution by looking at how other Wikipedians respond to it and whether it actually persists in the article or not. Um, so there's a few tricks that we have to work around. So for example, when somebody uh, performs a revert, we have to handle that change and uh, go back to an old state when we're tracking words. We wouldn't want somebody to, for example, blank a page and have somebody revert that page back to its old state and attribute the entire uh, article to that new person that performed that revert. Um, it turns out that we also have some nuance around difference algorithms for doing this sort of thing. This is a strategy that we actually use to, to track uh, what content persists between revisions. So um, imagine we have these lists of, of four words, and we're trying to figure out what sort of change happened to this list um, to get from the left side to the right side. This is pretty easy to eyeball with human intuition, especially because I've color coded it. We can see that the A at the beginning matches the A, the B matches the B, the C matches the C, and the D matches the D. Great. Um, however, the most common way of generating a difference between two chunks of text uh, using the longest common substring strategy, which is similar to the Unix diff utility if you've used that, fails to make one of the important connections here. So if you move a chunk of content, uh, just like I have with the, the B symbol here, um, the longest common substring strategy can't match those two Bs together. It can't figure out that that content was, was moved. So it will represent it as being removed and re-added. We can actually see this in diff on Wikipedia, the algorithm that generates the diffs that you can see as you're browsing around the wiki will show you diffs that commonly look like this. So we can see this, this paragraph here that starts with suicide bombing was also used against the Japanese. Up here we have suicide bombing was also used against the Japanese. This is the same paragraph, yet the diff says remove this paragraph and add this entire paragraph over again. It would be very problematic if refactorings like this screwed up the way that we tracked content persistence and made it so that we associated content with somebody who really didn't add it to the article, just somebody who, who maybe moved it to some other location in the article. 
So we have this problem of attributing authorship of content. So luckily, there's been some really nice research in this area that's <clears throat> that's been pushing on good ways to do this in an automated fashion. Um, so uh, there's been work by uh, Alfaro and uh, uh, Shevlovsky and uh, Flock and Acosta. And both of them are looking at how you do this, this author, uh, authorship tracking in the Wikipedia context. So they're actually testing their algorithms on English Wikipedia. And so as far as I can tell, this is the state of the art. So you take two versions of an article in Wikipedia, and you uh, uh, split it into paragraphs and sentences. And so there are some simple ways that we can do this with double line breaks and periods, and it mostly works OK. Um, you then take each sentence and generate a hash for it so that you can identify identical hashed sentences and paragraphs that cross the revision boundary. Um, then you take whatever's left over, whatever wasn't an actual perfect match, and just do the longest common substring strategy on that. Um, and it turns out that almost all of the time, it makes it so that uh, the diff algorithm matches human intuition for what content was moved and what content was actually changed in the article. Um, and so I've been using this strategy, the segment matching strategy, to uh, track the history of content in Wikipedia. So there's one more thing that I want to talk about. There's a few ways that we could measure how long something, something persists in Wikipedia, but I'd really like to set a threshold, a threshold by which any content that persists longer than this amount of time, this amount of revisions, is uh, considered good enough. It was actually a quality contribution. Um, but how much is enough? How much persisting is enough? Um, so for this, we did some sensitivity analyses. So uh, this plot, I don't want to spend too much time on. I'll make it intuitive in just a moment. Um, but it's showing the hazard that a word that's added to an article will be removed based on how many revisions it's persisted. And so we can see on the far left-hand side of this graph that as soon as you add a word to an article, if it, if it has not yet persisted through any revisions, it's got about a 15% chance of being removed in the next edit. If it doesn't get removed in that next edit, then it has a less than 5% chance of being removed in the next edit. And so anyway, we can see the decay over time. The longer your contributions to an article persist, the longer they're likely to persist. Um, and so it turns out that there was also some qualitative analysis that uh, Susan Biancani did, looking at these sort of measures in Wikipedia. Specifically, she took a random sample of, of edits in Wikipedia and used this content persistence measure, and then uh, drew correlations between how real humans thought about uh, uh, the quality of edits in Wikipedia and what the content persistence measure suggested about those edits in Wikipedia. And generally, the summary is that we can set a pretty good cutoff off at five revisions. If your, if your contribution lasts five revisions, then we can probably call it persisted. Um, but this is, this is great for articles that get edited a lot, because you can get that next five revisions in maybe a couple days or a week. But for articles that are seldom edited, maybe even articles that aren't even edited more than once a year, this could be a problem. So we also wanted to use uh, time, the actual time that a, a, a contribution persisted in an article as, as um, a, a cutoff here. And so um, in this plot on the right, I'm essentially showing you the same sort of hazard thing that I was talking about with the plot on the left. But rather than looking at subsequent edits, we're looking at hours after the word was added. Um, so again, if your contribution uh, uh, has, has not lasted zero hours yet, it has a 15% chance of being removed in the next hour. But if it lasts at least an hour before being removed, uh, then you have less than a 5% chance of being re uh, having it removed in the hour after that. And so we can see that this hazard of removal pretty much decays to zero around 10 hours. But there's some interesting artifacts in this graph that I want to point out. And that's, we have two steps here. They're kind of hard to see, and I'm not sure how, how uh, large you guys are seeing this on screen. I'll have my, my uh, slide deck up on the, the wiki afterwards so that you can dig into the slide and zoom in on it. But there's very obviously some steps here where the hazard goes down once we cross these uh, daily thresholds of 48 hours and 24 hours. And so what I think is happening there is that a lot of the times when somebody makes an edit that's not uh, really good for an article, then people will catch that because they see that edit appear on their watch list. And we know from some of my past work looking at editor sessions that editors tend to have 24-hour uh, periods between the times that they come on Wikipedia and do work. So it only sort of makes sense that here that we see people doing this sort of watch list, removing uh, damaging edit behavior on the 24 and 48-hour timescales. Um, and so using these graphs, um, 
I ended up choosing a cutoff of 48 hours so that we gave it two full 48 or two full 24 hour periods of people looking at their watch list to potentially remove this word. Um, so to translate this into English, I'm going to consider a word added to an article persisting um, if it survives at least five revisions by other people and 48 hours before being removed for forever. Um, so this is not a complete measurement of productivity and quality. This misses a lot of important work that Wikipedians do, such as their activity negotiating content on talk pages, developing templates, uploading images, performing the counter vandalism that lets this metric work in the first place, and of course doing research and tool development, which is what I do most of my work in. However, it's good in that it recognizes adding good new content to articles, assuming that Wikipedians are selecting for good new content, and it seems like that is definitely true. So now that we have this threshold, and I've talked to you about our sensitivity analysis to choose this threshold, I want to talk to you about what measurements this actually let us do. And I'll be focusing on the English Wikipedia. I haven't extended this beyond English Wikipedia yet, but that's on my plate. We'll get into that a little bit later. So when I look at the overall productivity of Wikipedia, just as a, a raw count of uh, persisting words added to articles over time, uh, we get this graph. This, each one of these bars on this graph represents a month of Wikipedian activity. And so there's something that, that <laughs> caught me right away when I looked at this graph that I just thought was completely unusual. Um, and that's, if you've ever heard me talk about Wikipedia before, you've probably heard me talk about Wikipedia's decline. And so on the, the graph on the left, I'm showing a graph of the active editors in Wikipedia. On the graph on the right, we're looking at this uh, overall productivity measure. The graph on the left, suggests that Wikipedia has been declining since 2007, but the graph on the right suggests that Wikipedia really hasn't entered into a substantial decline when it comes to this productivity measurement. That was really surprising because I've looked at all sorts of measures of productivity in Wikipedia before, but I've never seen this, this sort of non-decline pattern happening. So I actually don't like the measure of active editors to, to get a sense for these sort of things. I like a measure uh, called labor hours that I developed in, in uh, 2013, or at least published about in 2013, uh, where we can actually take uh, uh, editors' sessions editing the Wikipedia and make a pretty good estimate for how many hours they spend uh, doing their editing work. This, I would like to think, is sort of a measure of the input that goes into Wikipedia. We get about 12 million labor hours a year, and it's up to us to figure out effective things to do with that. Um, so this plot I'm pulling from this 2013 paper shows this rise and decline pattern. We can see in 2007 there was a sudden spike and then a decline in the number of hours that people were putting into Wikipedia. So just uh, note in case that you can't read the labels on this graph that the spike is around 600,000 labor hours per month. And uh, by the end of the graph, which is a little bit after 2012, it's like March 2012, we're down to about 400 labor hours. So just uh, using my eyeball and extending this graph to where it would likely be, assuming that the trend matches what we have for active editors, new article creations, edits to the wiki, um, we should expect a decay that looks about like this up to this day. And I want to highlight this to, to make it absolutely clear that I'm eyeballing this. I think it's a good eyeballing, but it is not a robust method. So, now, putting these next to each other, if we look at labor hours going into the wiki and um, persisting words added to articles uh, coming out of the wiki as input and output, it lets us ask questions about what is the sort of productive efficiency of Wikipedia, how much output are we getting per input. So, and we can see that the, you know, just eyeballing this, the slopes of these, these patterns are drastically different. Um, so what I did was I took values that are actually measured from the ends of this graph and drew some estimates. So in 2016, we got about 258 persisting words per labor hour of editor invested in Wikipedia. In 2015, we got 483 persisting words per labor hour uh, invested in Wikipedia. And so I, I forgot to actually put the number up on the chart, but this is an 86% increase in efficiency. That's really surprising. And so I wanted to find out, you know, where the heck is this efficiency coming from? And I started with a hypothesis. Maybe Wikipedians have better tools to help them edit articles faster so they can have fewer people spend less time but still end up doing the same amount. So I wanted to look for bots and automated tools that might be contributing to this pattern. So um, in this graph that I'm showing you, and I can show you with this little arrow, I'm just breaking out a few different editor types uh, from the larger set. So 
Um, on the very top of this plot, we have registered editors who are not using a tool to edit Wikipedia. Um, so they dominate the productivity measurement. They're adding by far the majority of the productivity that comes to Wikipedia. Um, but uh, just again, eyeballing this, this curve, we don't really see a decline here. Um, and this will be more interesting once I talk to you about the other things that we broke out of, of uh, this set. So anyway, yes, no real decline here. Um, uh, closer to the bottom, we can see the uh, IP editors. So the anonymous editors add somewhere on the order of uh, 500, or sorry, 5 million uh, persisting words uh, to Wikipedia per month. Um, you know, but we can see that there's, there's sort of looks like there's, there's something declining here. That, that it was much higher in 2007 than it is in 2005. Um, and then finally on the bottom, we have uh, uh, persistent words added by bots and by uh, tool-assisted registered editors. Um, and so there are some trends here, but I actually want to zoom in on this part of the graph so that we can talk <laughs> about them more closely. So uh, this graph is showing the overall proportion of productive contributions that these editors have been making, the bot, IP, and tool-assisted editors. So here, for uh, the IPs, we can see that the overall proportion of productive new content that they've been adding to Wikipedia has been in decline. In 2006, it was about 20%, and in 2015, it's about 15%. Um, so this is, this is sort of interesting. It both tells us that anons are important, but it also tells us that we're not getting nearly as much productivity from anonymous editors as we used to. There might be uh, uh, many interesting explanations for that that I'd like to talk about afterwards. Um, looking at bots, we don't see a sort of steady pattern. Bots are really bursty in their activity. There's really two spikes of bots adding productive new content to Wikipedia around 2008 and 2011. Um, and I'm not quite sure what those are. The actual underlying data shows some really tall spikes, and so we might be able to dig into the data and have a look at those months to see what's going on. But I, I don't have anything to tell you right now. But one other thing that you will notice is that after 2012, the productive new content added to articles from bots uh, entered a steep decline, and it doesn't look like it's, it's rising back up. And so I just wanted to ask the question, maybe this is Wikidata. Wikidata gained a lot of steam in 2012, and it's very uh, highly dominated by bots activities, maybe a lot of the people who are writing bots to fill in data on Wikipedia are instead using those bots to fill in data on Wikidata. Um, that would be an interesting thing to look into. Okay. Finally, I want to talk about tool-assisted edits. And so this is an example where the, the rate of productive new content to add into articles uh, from tool-assisted interfaces has been on a steady rise. Um, so I broke out the most common five tools that are used to add productive new content to articles so that we could talk a little bit about each one. Um, so by far the most productive or the, the yeah, the most productive uh, tool used in Wikipedia is Auto Wiki Browser. That's what this AWB stands for. Auto Wiki Browser is a standalone interface. You don't actually run this in your browser. I think that it's Windows only, but I'd have to go check. Um, that lets you automate doing a certain type of edit to a lot of articles really fast. And so on the left-hand side, we're selecting a category, and so we're going to apply an operation to a bunch of pages. We select the operations that we're going to perform. Uh, uh, AutoWiki browser will show us what the change actually looks like, and then we can hit uh, start to start processing uh, a bunch of articles. So this is sort of like a bot. Um, but it's, it's an actual user interface. It has a human in the loop, but it does very bot-like things. Um, so there's uh, two more that are used relatively commonly. So uh, reflinks is an old utility that would allow you to change a reference that's just a bare URL and format it using a citation template like Wikipedia uses. Um, reflinks recently uh, was removed from tool labs for various reasons. And so this new tool called refill, which essentially serves the same purpose, was brought in to replace it. And so we can sort of see the rise and decline of uh, reflinks and the sudden uh, bursty rise of refill. Um, and so I just want to show you a little bit about uh, this refill interface. It's actually quite beautiful. And I love this description that they have at the top, where it shows uh, changing a ref tag that only has example.com into it to a ref tag that has the proper citation template for example.com and actually pulls the title from the URL and all those wonderful things. Uh, wonderful tool. Turns out that it's adding a lot of high quality content to Wikipedia. 
Um, and so finally at the bottom, there's two tools that didn't really make that much of a blip on this plot, but they're they're pretty big compared to a lot of the, the other tools that are used on Wikipedia. So I thought that they uh, warranted inclusion here. So AutoEd is a, a user script. It's a piece of JavaScript that runs on top of Wikipedia and allows people to do auto wiki browser like activities where with one click of a click of a button, you can perform many operations. Um, and uh, OConfucius actually is a user who develops uh, several different types of scripts that perform these types of automated operation. And so both uh, AutoEd and OConfucius tend to get flagged in edits that are, are doing sort of like this batch editing activity. Okay, so in summary, I want to go over these graphs again and tell you, uh, uh, remind you what I talked to you about. So one is the surprising thing that it looks like uh, efficiency when we look at labor hours compared to productive contributions to articles. Uh, efficiency is up 80% from where it was in 2006, and that's really surprising. Um, we can also see that most of the productive new content in Wikipedia is added by registered editors editing manually. However, anonymous editors are still contributing 15 to 20% of the productive new content in articles. Uh, we can also see that tool use is on the rise. Tool, uh, automated tools are helping editors add a good productive new content to Wikipedia, and they're more, mostly force multipliers, where one button will click or one button will uh, 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 one button click will make a lot of edits. Or they're doing things like reference cleanup. This seems to be sort of like a killer use case of one of these uh, tools. Okay, and now for fun, because I didn't really have any uh, fun research questions in this space, but I thought you might like to, to see what does this productivity measure look like for individuals? And so, of course, I'm going to pick on myself quick and look at my productivity over time. Um, so epoch fail is my volunteer account. So in this graph, uh, these bars on the bottom represent the monthly productive contributions that I made to articles in Wikipedia. And this error that or this area that's going up over the top is the cumulative sum of the total productivity that I had in Wikipedia. And so that's why you can see these giant steps at the point where I actually do something that month. Um, and so uh, there, there's a couple things that I want to point out. So uh, my most productive contribution was actually a conflict of interest, which I filed on the talk page. I wrote the article about my old research lab, Group Lens Research at the University of Minnesota. Um, and in fact, I encourage you to go to that talk page because I think I did a pretty good job of managing my conflict of interest, and I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but you know, like one thing that you might ask, looking at this graph, is what the heck has Epoch Fail been up to since 2010? And so here I am living the experience of having this measure not accounting for a lot of the things that I do in the wiki. It turns out that if you go to my user page, I'll talk to you about the tools that I've been developing for Wikipedia editors since 2010, like ORS, which is an online machine learning service, Wikilabels, which allows people to label things in Wikipedia so that we can train these machine learning models, Snuggle, that's a newcomer support and help system, Mr. Clean, that has helps you add cleanup templates, Wikinome that allows you to edit uh, a sentence at a time while you're reading the article. And you know this list goes on, and they're, 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 I, they're real contributions. I, at least I think so. I think that they are really contributing productively to Wikipedia. But they don't show up as article contributions, and so my graph looks very sad after 2010. OK, so picking on a few other people, uh, since we have Guillaume in the room, uh, I asked him if I, if I could pull up his graph here. So we can see that Guillaume is much more consistent. Um, so he doesn't have huge spikes of activity one month and here or there and then long periods of inactivity. He's really picking up the uh, uh, contributing to articles on a relatively regular basis, um, but not very much. In fact, when I was talking to Guillaume about this, he, he warned me, you should probably look at French Wikipedia because my graph is probably going to lo look a lot different there. Um, and so another one that I thought might be fun is Jimbo Wales. Um, so we can see that Jimbo Wales actually looks a lot more like my activity um, and that he's very periodic and will often disappear for long periods of time or not contribute that much for long periods of time. But it's really important to understand that Jimmy Wales is way beyond the scale of where uh, Guillaume and I are. Um, so if I were to, to plot the cumulative uh, distribution of, or the cumulative sum for myself and Guillaume, we would be right at the bottom of this graph. We wouldn't even, we would be pale in comparison to how much contribution Jimmy Wales has. But even Jimmy Wales uh, pales in comparison to an editor like DGG. DGG is somebody who I've been talking to quite recently uh, because he works in a lot of newcomer help spaces in Wikipedia, specifically the uh, Articles for Creation newcomer help space where uh, he and a bunch of other Wikipedians help newcomers write drafts that will stick in Wikipedia. 
And so DGG looks like he's not making very big contributions because all of his bars are at the bottom of the graph. Um, but it turns out that every single month of activity uh, in DGG's history is bigger than my biggest month of activity. And so if I put uh, myself and Guillaume and Jimbo Wales on this graph, again, we're towards the bottom. We just pale in comparison to how much productive new content somebody like GG, DGG has added to Wikipedia. OK, so that's all I have for you. I'm just going to go back over my takeaways, the things that I would really like you to walk away from this talk with. So first, this content persistence measure is a robust way to, of measuring article activity. Um, we look at the survival of content, and we use that uh, as an uh, implicit measure of quality. Tracking authorship is hard, so there's some fun research in the space that I've been taking advantage of, but there's definitely more work that we can do. And this is a useful measure, but it's incomplete. Um, and I can you know, speak from experience that my graph does not capture my full contribution to Wikipedia. So, We've also seen that the English Wikipedia seems to be getting more efficient, and it's sort of hard to see why this is the case. We see that uh, the labor hours that people have been putting into Wikipedia has been decreasing quite substantially over time, uh, but the output of Wikipedia editors, even when we just look at registered editors and remove bots and tools, has been holding relatively constant, so that we see a, a, about an 86% uh, efficiency increase since 2006. This is definitely worth looking into. And finally, anonymous editor contributions are important. They add about 15 to 20% of the overall productivity in Wikipedia. So the next time that we release a new interface or a new way of consuming Wikipedia content, we should make sure that anonymous editors can contribute fully while logged out. Um, and we should probably not be pushing anonymous editors so strongly to register their accounts. Uh, next steps in this, of course I want to do more wikis. Uh, English Wikipedia, it turns out, is the most difficult to process, so smaller wikis should be easier. There are no wikis that are bigger than English Wikipedia, and I'm specifically going to work on targeting emerging, communi emerging communities, uh, which is something that the community resource team is uh, developing a list of so that we can start seeing what's going on in those wikis. Um, I'll be mixing these productivity measures with measures of importance, such as page views or measures that we can get from the link draft. Uh, the link graph, um, so that we can get a sense for value added, th with the idea that if you're productive in important places, that's more valuable. And then finally, getting an interface online so that people can look at their productivity measures. I think this will both be interesting for maybe uh, improving how productive people are in contributing to Wikipedia, and also uh, allowing them a nice channel for critiquing the measures so that we can develop new and better measures for getting at this productivity stuff. Um, finally, I've already got some data sets that we'll, re we'll be releasing open access, and we'll be getting those uploaded into the Quarry querying system, too, so that you can play around with them. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Garen? All right, so I think we have a, a couple of minutes uh, for questions. I haven't heard uh, anything from IRC. Okay, fantastic. So you want to relate them? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first question, Aaron, is uh, what was the self-persisting token thingy? Is that a survival of text written by someone? Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. Uh, what was the self-persisting token thing? Like, uh, yeah, so... So there, there's some, some jargon that I, I removed from the slides, but I didn't get all of it. Um, so so uh, the, ba the, the measure of, of uh, persisting that I used uh, was based not on just surviving through subsequent revisions, but they have to be uh, revisions that were made by somebody who isn't yourself. So non-self-persisting uh, means that uh, your content stuck in the article through other people's edits uh, or hit our time threshold. Um, and I should have removed that and just called that persisting words. I'll, I'll take the next one. I'll relate. Uh, it's actually similar to a question that I had. So two questions from IRC. Um, first, suggesting we should reach out to tool developers. And I feel the same, like that this data about uh, the productivity of any generated by individual tools where they're all kind of semi-related. I think it's fascinating. We should totally do this. Um, so just, on, just a note quick on that. Um, so, so it's really hard to generate these statistics in real time. But my, my goal uh, in this project is to make this so that it's uh, as simple as hitting an API, where you could say, you know, score this edit for me and tell me how long the words persisted, or score this user for me and tell, the, tell me how productive they've been over time. So it's, it's hard, but that's exactly what I'm working on. If there's somebody out there who, who wants to help develop these technologies, please reach out to me. Yeah, and Hashar is virtually hugging you for doing this. 
just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, and uh, the second question um, that, that I had uh, is related to your uh, analysis of breakdown as a function of the type of agent, if you wish. And what I'm wondering is uh, what is the effect uh, of cohort, right? You know that, uh, especially over the last couple of years, uh, the, uh, the, the vast majority of edits and work, uh, especially on the most mature wikis, has been performed by the, the older cohorts. So I'm wondering to what extent uh, the underlying factor is uh, people who are more expert uh, getting the lion's share of these edits. Yeah, I think I, I think that that's a good question, and I, I think it's a solid hypothesis too. Um, like one of the things that might just be happening is that the experienced editors as a group are getting more competent and collaborating uh, with each other effectively, making edits that other people won't get upset about, or bringing conversations to consensus quickly. And that um, that if this were really happening, then it would probably be the people who are around Wikipedia for the longest. I haven't done a cohort analysis um, to to look at that sort of thing. And this is one of the big reasons why I want to get this data set released publicly. Um, I have a lot of other work to do, especially around ORS and the Rev Scoring project. And I would really like it if others who were interested in asking these questions could answer them relatively easily. And so uh, by releasing the data set, we can do more of these uh, uh, drill downs into various angles that, that people have thought of that I haven't thought of. Um, so, so yeah, I guess to, to not answer your question, I don't, I, I don't know yet. Um, I think that that's a really an interesting uh, question, and it would be really great if somebody else could pick that up. I'd like to help. Sweet. Just thank you uh, for the last time. If you have any questions, uh, and if not, I think we'll be moving to the second question and continue um, at the at the end of the of the two talks. Sure. Start your, your presentation. Again, 25 minutes, and uh, we'll continue with questions at the end. OK. Well, um, wow, uh, Aaron, uh, that was a, a fascinating. It's going to be hard to move after you, but you've, well, I'm, I'm getting used to it. You, you did the same thing to me at Wikimania 2014, so uh, let's try. Um, OK, so thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, thank you, Dario and Leila, for putting this all to, together. Um, so let's try and share the slide. Okay, can you can you see it well? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a project which uh, I started a while ago when I was uh, at the Berkman Center, and it basically deals in a very general way with uh, the pro-social foundations of cooperation uh, within Wikipedia. Um, but what I'd like to do today, in the interest of time, is to really focus this presentation on two very specific sets of results and rely on those to ask a couple of questions which I think are important and should attract the interest of uh, the editor or the researcher uh, that, lies, uh, that lies in you. Um, but before I do that, let me maybe start with a very quick uh, thought experiment. Um, and I'm going to use this animation to help me make my points. Imagine that you're participating in an experiment. You're the guy who has uh, the, the green, uh, the, the green uh, dollar bills here. You're participating in that experiment with three other people in the group. Each member of the group has a private dotation of $10. Then each one of you has a private decision to make. How much? Um, taken out of those $10 you want to keep for yourself, in which case you just earn that money, and how many dollars taking out of those $10 you want to invest in a common project. Now, each dollar that you're going to invest in this common project is going to yield a private return on, of $0.4 to you personally. So that it's really not efficient for you to invest in that common project. However, as it turns out, uh, each dollar that you invest in this common project is also going to yield 0.4 dollar to the three other members of your group. So that by investing one dollar, you actually create 1.6 dollar for the group as a well. whole. So uh, people have been analyzing those kind of situations as uh, public goods dilemmas. Uh, and if you are perfectly selfish and rational, well, you should never contribute in such a situation. But if everybody's like that, that nobody contributes, and we end up in a very, uh, in a very inefficient social situation. So what I'm going to claim here is 
that this uh, game theoretical scenario is actually a metaphor for uh, the decision to contribute to Wikipedia. And I really like you to think about each and every decision to contribute to Wikipedia as a public goods dilemma uh, uh, in, in, in this respect. Indeed, uh, there are no extrinsic incentives uh, to push you to contribute in those kind of situations. You're not getting paid to contribute. And you can't even uh, uh, hope to get a better job and signal your qualities on the labor market by contributing. Uh, so really, this uh, kind of public good dilemma is at the core of the decision to contribute to Wikipedia. This is the question that many people ask themselves when they notice some changes, some uh, implementation, the implementation of some uh, enhancement that they could make uh, on a Wikipedia article. Should I incur the private cost of contributing knowledge in order to reach a socially efficient outcome, that is, let other people around me benefit from this knowledge which I already hold, but need to put in a good format so that other people can actually access it. And so in this respect, I kind of like that quote by Kizor, who's a Wikipedia administrator, who tells us, the problem with Wikipedia is that it only works in practice. In theory, it can never work. And I hope that um, this game makes really precise how, in theory, it should not work. Um, now, I like that quote, even though in practice it's actually wrong. Uh, we do have theory around that tells us why uh, people would be willing to contribute in those kind of public goods uh, situations. And we basically have three kind of models that assume different kind of what economists call pro-social preferences. That is, you're going to be willing to put in your own uh, welfare function, the welfare of other people around you in different ways. And we have three classes of models for that, uh, three main preferences that can push you towards contribution when you ask yourself that, that very question. Should I incur this personal cost to reach a socially efficient outcome? The first uh, of those motivations is based on altruism. Basically, what makes you happy is to provide uh, um, value added to the people around you. The second one is based on reciprocity, whereby you will be willing to contribute if you see that other people around you are also contributing. You derive welfare from those interactions that you entertain with people while contributing to the public good. Finally, uh, the last class of models being put forward by the literature and the social science is based on a social image, whereby you would be willing to incur this personal cost if by contributing you're able to signal some quality about yourself to a community of people that you care about. This is really what social image is about. And so what I'm going to do today is basically elicit the social types of uh, a sample of Wikipedia contributor that's representative of their diversity with an online experiment, which I will couple with observational data. And then I will use the revealed social type of those contributors in this experiment to predict antisocial slash non-cooperative behavior within Wikipedia. Now, this is kind of the game plan for today, but some people now might just ask themselves uh, this question, why not simply use survey questions? What not basically ask people? And this study purposefully does not rely on survey method. Why? Basically because we know that people are prone to self-reporting biases. If I ask you what is your social type, uh, you're going to tell me whatever uh, works best with your own view of yourself or what you think uh, I want to hear or whatever. Also, people might not have a clear ID of their own social type. And finally, going the experimental way in a very contextualized uh, fashion, in a sense, allows me to get at very deep underlying preferences, which are most likely to carry over from one context to, to the next. And so this is why I want to use an experiment rather than survey methods for this project. OK. So I think that, that we're basically good. Um, so uh, what Wikipedians did in, uh, in this project is that they actually played this public goods game, which I just uh, uh, explained to you. But what I'm going to allow you to do in this game is to condition your contribution on the average contribution of the three other members of your group. As you can see here uh, in this uh, decision screen, 
I'm going to ask you, if the other members of your group on average contribute zero, how much do you want to contribute? If they contribute one, two, three to the column project, how much do you want to contribute? And I'm going to use those conditional contribution decisions uh, to uh, infer your social type. I'm going to basically distinguish between four types. The first type, if you look at this graph, uh, is going to be uh, free riders. Free riders basically play uh, the, the rational strategy. Uh, they uh, never contribute and they maximize their earnings in any event by keeping their 10 bucks and if other people contribute, free writing on the benefits of those contributions. Basically, you're reading Wikipedia, you will never contribute. Uh, this is the baseline group against which I'm going to compare the, 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 the behavior of the, of, the, of the other social types, so to speak. First group, free writers. Second group, we're going to have reciprocators. Reciprocators are those, uh, those guys who decide to exactly match what the other people of their group do. They're going to contribute if other people around them contribute. We're also going to have weak reciprocators. As it turns out, those, those guys are, uh, are a pretty large fraction of people in the population. Uh, they react to an increase uh, in, the other people, uh, in the other people's contributions, but less than proportionally. Finally, we're going to have uh, those uh, altruists, which, uh, I, uh, which uh, I talked about. Uh, and this is kind of the mirror image of uh, free riders in the sense that those guys will always contribute a very high fraction of their endowments, irrespective of the average contribution of the other members of their group. Okay? So those are, are kind of the, of, the, of, the, of the different social types that I'm going to elicit through uh, Wikipedia's behavior in this experiment. And it's going to be important for you to remember that when Wikipedians actually played this experiment, they played with other random internet users, not with Wikipedia uh, contributors. Uh, now you're going to ask me, we, we have reciprocity preference there, we have altruism, what about social image? Well, social image is very difficult to measure experiments. I mean, people have tried. Uh, it's, it's, it's very hard. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to rely on the wealth of observational data that we can extract from Wikipedia in order to uh, construct indicators of revealed preference for social image within Wikipedia. And I'm going to try and do that in two very simple ways in order to try to uh, see and check for the consistency of the results that I get. First, I'm going to make use of personal Wikipedia user page data. For all the participants in this study, and there are about like 850 of them, um, I'm going to measure the size of their user page and consider them as social signalers, quote unquote, if they have a user page whose size in bytes is bigger than the median in sample. Very simple indicator. If the size of your user page is bigger than the median, I code you as a social signaler. Otherwise, you're a non-social signaler, not really concerned about so your social image within the community. Second indicator is going to rely on Barnstar's data. Here, I'm going to restrict the sample of subjects to those who already received barn stars. And I'm going to consider, as social signalers, those who decided to manually move at least one of those barn stars from their talk page, on which they typically receive those barn stars, to their personal user page, so that it would be displayed for everybody to see forever. To me, the fact that contributors are willing to manually move their bond stars to their personal user page is an indication that they care about their social image uh, within the community, and so I'm going to consider them social signals. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, again, we have uh, an experimental protocol to disentangle free riders from reciprocators, from altruists, and then we have data from Wikipedia that hopefully allows us to get uh, at uh, people's preference for social image within the community. And now I'm going to use those revealed preferences to try and predict uh, antisocial behavior uh, within Wikipedia and see what, what I can learn uh, from that. Okay, so first uh, result, collaborativeness of contributors and antisocial behavior. I'm going to operationalize uh, antisocial behavior in two distinct ways. First, I'm going to take the proportion of the subject's reverts that do not feature any kind of explanation. Basically, you have a blank edit summary field. Uh, you do not provide any reason why you reverted uh, uh, a particular edit. 
Second, I'm going to take the number of times uh, as the one of our subjects started an, an editor with another contributor on a Wikipedia article. I define an editor in all sorts of ways. In the article here, I'm going to stick with the following definition. Uh, one of our subjects reverts another contributor C on a Wikipedia article. C reverts that sub the subject on that same article. And finally, the subject come back, comes back and reverts C, therefore going back to the first uh, situation, knowing that those three steps must be consecutive to count as an edit one. Right? So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, explain, in turn, both of those antisocial behavior controlling for a bunch of demographic characteristics at the individual, at the individual level, and including the social types, at risk, reciproc reciprocal, or social uh, signaler of subjects to see uh, how it correlates with antisocial behavior. This is just to show you how such behavior correlates with uh, demographic characteristics that I have about uh, our subjects. What you can see that it's very, actually very difficult to predict, uh, be it the proportion of reverts that do not feature an explanation here, or the number of editors that subjects uh, start. Basically, age matters, and that's it. The conflictuality score of the articles uh, that editors uh, contribute to is negatively correlated to, uh, to uh, this indicator, positively to this one, which makes sense. Other than that, not much is happening. Now, controlling for those, what the next table does is that it estimates the impact of those social types here, weak reciprocators, reciprocators, and altruists, contrasted all else equal to free riders, and here, social signalers contrasted to non-social signalers for the user page measure, and here for the barn source measure. So what do we see? Each of those coefficients you can interpret as the estimated percentage change in the dependent variable. Here, the, propor the proportion of reverts without an explanation. Here, the number of editors started. When you move from revealing free writing preferences to altruist reciprocators or weak reciprocators preferences. Here, social signaler versus not. What we see is that subjects who reveal reciprocal or altruist preferences actually justify their reverts much, much more. On average, the prevalence of, uh, of uh, reverts that are not justified in the sample is about 6%. So by having those preferences, you basically uh, curb uh, that behavior uh, to zero. Um, if uh, you look at the barn star measure of uh, social image, uh, you also see that social signalers uh, justify their reverts uh, much more than others. Now, if we turn our attention to the number of editors that we start, we get a somewhat more, somewhat more nuanced result. What you see here is that altruists and reciprocators, again, start less editors, they are more cooperative when they interact with others, less antisocial behaviors. But here, contrary to the previous estimation, social signalers actually have much more conflictual relationship within the encyclopedia. They start much more editors, like about 70% more here. Here, the same, 33% uh, more editors for social signalers as opposed to not. So what explains this behavior? Well, I think that the, there are some variables uh, there that can help us uh, understand what's going on. If we go back to the proportion of reverts that are not explained, what we see here in the control variables is that the number of barn stars that subjects receive is negatively correlated with the proportion of uh, reverts that are not explained. This totally makes sense. Uh, the community recognizes that it's a bad idea not to justify your reverts. Now, if we move to the edit word thing, and this was kind of surprising to me and needs to be understood, what we find is that the number of barn stars that subjects receive is actually very strongly correlated with the number of editors that they start. Controlling for the conflictuality of the topics to which they typically contribute. So that suggests that actually, um, uh, at the margin, the community seems to reward 
confrontational and self-assertive behavior. And so this pretty much uh, is in line with the finding that those very users who care about their social image within the community exhibit much more conflictual relationships. So now from there, I'd like to ask uh, the following question. Why does the community seem to reward such confrontational assertive behavior under certain conditions? It could be, for instance, that uh, it's an efficient thing to uh, assert your opinions in a non-cooperative way by uh, fighting directly uh, through uh, edits within the body of the article if uh, the cost of opening up the discussion is too high. It may be an efficient way to just close the debate if uh, everybody agrees, just uh, fight and let, uh, let the guy who is wrong uh, uh, um, abandon the, 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 the fight, basically. It could be efficient from the contributor's perspective, is my point. So we need to understand why does the community reward such behavior. Once we understand why, can we find ways to modify those community incentives in order to alleviate this antisocial behavior and build a more inclusive uh, Wikipedia? This is my kind of first question for, for, for the research slash editor community. The second set of results is going to be linked to uh, governance. And I'm going to look at, uh, at uh, administrators here uh, trying to see whether the level of trust that administrators typically have in strangers around them impact the way they, uh, they, um, they uh, use their policing rights within the encyclopedia. Uh, in order to do that, I'm going to need yet another experimental tool. So let me uh, very quickly explain to you uh, what that tool is. Um, imagine that you're participating in yet another experiment and uh, that you are participant A here. I would call participant A the trustee. Uh, you and the other, the, the other guy who is playing with you in this game uh, are both endowed with uh, $10. But you have a private decision to make that participant B does not have. You can decide to transfer to participant B any amount taken from your initial endowment from 0 to 10. Any amount, as you can see here in the animation, that you transfer to participant B is going to be tripled. Then participant B receives the amount, and participant B has a private decision to make in turn. How much of the amount that he receives does he want to send back, return to you, knowing that he has absolutely no obligations to do so. So if you send all of your endowment to participant B, you send 10 bucks, he's going to receive 30. He has no obligation to return a single dollar to you. So actually, I'm going to interpret the fraction of your endowment that you're willing to send to participant B, knowing that this guy is totally anonymous. You don't know him, and it's the only interaction you're ever going to have with that guy over the internet. The fraction that you're willing to send to that guy is a direct measure of the trust that you're willing to put in strangers around. And that's what I'm going to use to uh, study the link between generalized trust and the policing activity, focusing on Wikipedia administrators uh, who participated in this experiment. OK, so this is what this uh, table does. You hear, here you have uh, uh, this value of trust. And again, the coefficients, uh, which you interpret in the same way as percentage change in the number of contributions that is estimated if you move from no trust to full trust in the game. Now, the first thing that I do is that I first check here that there is absolutely no significant correlation between uh, the trust level of regular slash non-admin contributors and the number of contributions that they make to Wikipedia. There is no reason to believe that trust should be related to uh, contributions among regular editors. However, if I move to the same sample of Wikipedia administrators, what I see is that an increase in trust is very strongly negatively related to the activity level of Wikipedia administrators. Now, if I, if I distinguish 
this overall activity level in terms of number of users blocked, pages deleted, or number of pages protected, I find again that same uh, negative uh, uh, relationship uh, which holds. Uh, as a final piece of evidence, I actually went back to those administrators six months after the completion of the study, asking them, can you tell me uh, in a scale from uh, zero to, uh, to, to seven, if I remember right, maybe nine, I don't, I don't remember precisely, uh, what's the fraction of your working time that you dedicate to admin activities on Wikipedia? I think it was from zero to nine. Zero was absolutely nothing, nine was all of my time. And here again, I only got 27 answers, but even with this very small sample size, there is a very strong negative relationship between administrators' trust level in strangers and the time that they self-declare dedicating to admin activities on Wikipedia. So this is an interesting finding in itself. The social attitudes of those administrators have an impact on the way they manage the governance of the community. But here is my question. What is the optimal level of trust that administrators should exhibit in order to efficiently protect the common resource while maximizing participation? You do want to keep vandals out, but you don't want to discourage uh, a good faith editors who are still learning the rules of the game. And once we figure out ways to uh, understand what that optimal level of trust should be, can we actually nudge admins towards the adoption of the right level of user trust in order to build a more inclusive, Wiki inclusive Wikipedia, letting vendors out, but making sure that we bring good faith contributors in without discouraging them uh, at an early stage. This is kind of the uh, kind of the provocative thoughts that I wanted to share uh, uh, with you guys. Uh, this is by no way a comprehensive account of uh, what we do, but this is kind of the of the format uh, that that uh, that I thought would make uh, the most uh, sense for for this uh, for this particular presentation. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, and look forward to your thoughts and and comments. Thanks, Jerome. Great talk. Um, I think we have a few questions from the audience from IRC. So I'll ask Karen to ask the first question, since he was uh, the first one to uh, raise his hand. Oops. There we go. Hey. So uh, I'm curious, when you were looking at the uh, custom uh, um, uh, edit comments on reverting edits, um, did you did you exclude auto-generated edit summaries that might come from Huggle or Undo or Rollback or something like that? I actually didn't. Um, so uh, do you think that this is important? So I, I, I did a, a similar type of analysis where we're looking at how often people who revert other edits will, will respond to people when they reach out and ask them, why did you revert my edit? And I found that it, it varies quite dramatically on, on the tool that's used. And I, so I was really surprised to see that I, I think you said 6% of people didn't explain their reverts. And I, I, I think it's more the opposite. 6% of people actually say anything at all beyond, I reverted you. Huh. So, okay, so I may be capturing a lot of, uh, of uh, justifications that are, uh, that are on the part of bots, uh, yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, or, or just something that the tool that they're using generates. It would be interesting to see the analysis controlling for those things. I have a bunch of regular expressions I can give you if you, want, if you have the data and can rerun it. Yeah, sure. Sure, I can do cool. that. that. That would be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a very good point. So I'm going to look into this. Thank you, Aaron. All right, so I think the people on IRC do see if there are other questions. Anyone any, from the room? Um, I have one question I want to ask next, but I want to check first. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, um, Jeremy, this is more related to the uh, your final question about next steps, right? So, um, my understanding of that test is that when it comes to understanding demographics uh, of these users, uh, you didn't really collect uh, much data about. Uh, you know, any demographic trait that might be another variable uh, driving those effects. Um, and I want to check if that is the case, and also hear your thoughts to expand a bit more about uh, um, something we discussed, you know, two days ago around uh, understanding more, for example, how this affects uh, women, or specifically uh, minorities uh, on Wikipedia. So uh, I, I didn't get the very last part, so can you say that again? 
Sure, yeah. So uh, the first question is uh, if you collected other demographic uh, information uh, from participants in the test. And the second question is related to the next steps, uh, uh, particularly how we can apply this uh, towards uh, um, uh, demographic groups, whether it's gender-based uh, or geographic-based, um, or minority on Wikipedia. OK. Um, so regarding the first question, I do collect demographic information, but very basic information. So basically, what I have is age, gender, uh, education level, uh, salary level, risk aversion level, whether you, you, you want to take risks in, in your life, and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is actually one of the tables that I showed you in this presentation, is that that demographic information explains virtually nothing of what happens in that space. So all of those social types, and I was myself uh, kind of surprised by this, uh, have much more explanatory power than basic demographic variables when you're looking at antisocial behavior. Uh, so that's for uh, the first question. Uh, then uh, the second question, uh, how, might, how could we use this to try and um, devise interventions that would allow us to increase uh, retention rates? Um, well, I'm not totally sure. Um, so this is certainly something that, 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 uh, that needs to be, uh, to, be, to, be, to be thought about. I think we can try and design some intervention at least as far as question one is concerned. Um, question one was, we really need to understand why the community seems to reward confrontational behavior in cer under certain conditions. And once we understand that, uh, if there is a good reason for them to, to do this, then we need to find, to build tools that allow them to reach the same goal without having to rely on antisocial behavior. Uh, that, that would be my take on the issue. And if, you don't need any kind of big uh, intervention necessarily uh, to achieve this goal. Now, regarding the optimal level of trust that administrators should, should exhibit, um, I'm starting to think about this issue now, but I don't have any, any good answer for you, uh, for you right now. Cool. Thank you. Great did, that, did, did that make any sense? Or? It does. OK. Um, I have one question for you, Joel. Um, so about war stars and edit wars. Um, so my question is, have you looked at the effect of war stars on editors over time? Can it be that you know when you start, when you receive your first war star, your behavior is very different than when you receive your 20th? Um, and that's not necessarily because if, I mean there there is a control mechanism that you know the community can stop giving you war stars, but then war stars are in their own. Can they make me worse? Burn stars are there? On their own, can they make somebody worse, kind of in terms of behavior? So if I receive more and more burn stars, do I be sort of, you know, any feelings of, you know, entitlement or uh, anything yeah. that I can do? So, yep, so I think they're, uh, I'm sorry, are you done? Yep, okay. Um, so I think there are two separate questions here. Um, the first one is, do contributors react differently uh, when they receive a barn star? This is actually a question that I did not investigate myself. But using the same kind of data, uh, Aaron Shaw and Mako Hill did just that. And uh, what they do is that they contrast those social signalers to non-social signalers, and they see how they react uh, when they, uh, in terms of uh, editing activity when they receive uh, a barn star. And uh, what you see is that uh, actually uh, contributions go down after you receive a barn star on average. Why? Because you receive a barn star is because you've been recently very, very active, right? But contributions go down less for social signatures than non-social signatures. Uh, that's what happens. Now, this has no bearing on the results that I showed you. Uh, in this presentation, because what I'm actually interested in is not the number of barn stars that you receive, is controlling for the number of barn stars that you receive 
whether you actually decided to move those from your talk page to your user page. And this is what really reveals uh, your taste for social image within the community, as opposed to the sheer number or the timing of uh, those, uh, those, those awards. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. OK, checking if there's any other question on uh, IRC. People ping me if you want me to relay anything. But it doesn't look like. Any more from the room before we wrap up? No? OK, so with that, thanks a lot to our speakers. And uh, uh, I guess I'll see you all uh, next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Take care, folks. <laughs>